Good evening. Welcome to the Core Club and to a joint. Uh, uh, this is a second in a series of joint presentations by the American Enterprise Institute, Center for New American Security, and the New America Foundation. My name is Peter Berg, and I run the National Security Program at the New America Foundation. Uh, today's event uh, is being webcast uh, live on CNN.com. Uh, I want to thank Richard Gallant, uh, who's here tonight, for organizing that. Um, we're going to talk tonight about uh, America and the Pacific Century, and we have a wonderful uh, panel to do that. Uh, Bob Kaplan, Robert Kaplan, who's I'm sure well known to many of you, uh, will be speaking for about 20 minutes. Uh, he's the author of uh, a dozen books, including a book uh, called Monsoon, which focuses on the question of uh, the Indian Ocean and the future of power there, in, in, uh, both American, Chinese, and, and Indian. Um, he is also a, a fellow at CNAS. He's also been recently uh, appointed as the chief uh, geopolitical strategist at, at Stratfor. Um, and we're really thrilled that you've agreed to do this, Bob. Thank you. Uh, to his left is Steve Cole, my boss, uh, the CEO of the New America Foundation, uh, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, his book, uh, which I'm sure will get, gather a great deal of attention, uh, Private Empire, about ExxonMobil, will be coming out on mm -hmm. May 1st. And I'm sure Steve will have something to say about Chinese, the Chinese uh, and their effort to seek uh, gas and oil around the world. Uh, to his left, we have Patrick Cronin. Dr. Patrick Cronin is a professor at the National Defense University. He's also at CNAS as a senior advisor. Uh, he's an expert on uh, the Asia Pacific. In fact, he was testifying in Congress today on North Korea. Uh, he's held senior positions at uh, US uh, AID uh, and uh, a variety of academic institutions, including in London at the uh, IISS. And to his left, finally, is Thomas uh, Donnelly who uh, is one of the country's leading experts on de defense, defense budgeting, um, and uh, the author of uh, multiple books uh, himself, uh, used to work in Congress as a professional staff member on the House Armed Services Committee. So, Paul, thank well, you. Well, thank you very much, Peter. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Let me start this way. We've all been prisoners of two things growing up, the Mercator projection and Cold War area studies. Um, the Mercator projection is that rectangular piece, you know, a rendition of the map with North and South America in the center, the Atlantic Ocean and the eastern half of the Pacific to their sides, so that the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific are split up in half at the edges and consigned to the edges of consciousness. But if you look at a demographic projection of the world in 2050, say, you will see that nine of seven of nine billion people <clears throat> of the Earth's nine billion people will live more or less around the, these edges that are, con that are basically cut off with the Mercator projection. If you include East Asia, Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, the greater Middle East, and the eastern half of Africa, you have seven of nine billion people of which the greater Indian Ocean and its antechambers, like the Red Sea and the South China Sea, are, is the maritime organizing principle. And I emphasize the word maritime because even though we live in a jet and information age, 90% of all goods that travel intercontinentally do so by sea. Globalization is the age of the container ship. Um, and, if, and, if, and two, two organizations that aren't always thought this way, but in fact enable globalization greatly, is the US Air Force and the US Navy. Um, because they more or less protect, do more than any other organizations to protect the sea lines of communication. Uh, consigning piracy to being an exotic nuisance um, um, at the edges that, it, you know, in, in, in the western third of the Indian Ocean and some other places. Um, so you take away this, you know, this uh, unipolar American air sea power, or you diminish it greatly, and globalization may look very differently. Um, now, in this world of we'll call the greater Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific. Uh, it's, it's, we've been prisoners of Cold War area studies in this sense. Uh, 
At the end of World War II, the United States found itself a global power. It needed area experts for deep dive knowledge of specific reasons, linguistic, cultural. So the world was divided up into East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, the Middle East, etc. Uh, universities did this, think tanks did this, um, the CIA, the Pentagon, the State Department um, all did this. Um, now that's still very important because we still need area expertise. On the other hand, what you're seeing um, is increasingly, um, on a daily basis, interactions from one area to the other. Uh, the North Koreans in Northeast Asia give Syria and the Middle East nuclear technology that elicits an Israeli military response. Um, China in East Asia and India in South Asia fight for, uh, you know, de for developing natural gas pipelines and ports in the Bay of Bengal off Myanmar and Southeast Asia. India and China compete for natural gas rights on the Iranian plateau. Everyone is everywhere, so to speak. And so rather than a world split apart where you can look at the Indian subcontinent as one issue and the Middle East as another issue, the world, this world, is becoming more of a fluid, organic continuum where one area affects the other like never before. And so we're going back to a classical super region uh, where you have Yemenis in significant numbers living in Indonesia on the opposite side of the Indian Ocean, uh, where you have Malays living in Madagascar on the other side of the Indian Ocean. Uh, everyone is everywhere. And this super region is going to get more organic. Um, for, for these reasons, the, di um, the, the connections between the Western Pacific and the Indian Ocean are going to get greater because uh, not only are there can can canal projects being thought of in the Isthmus of Kra in, uh, in southern Thailand, connecting the Bay of Bengal with the South China Sea, you have Dubai Ports World doing feasibility studies on land bridges across peninsular Malaysia because, you know, the increase in energy shipments, the in increase in container shipments, despite a global economic slowdown, despite the fact that Chinese economic growth will, will go down, is still going to, in, in, at whole, increase to make these land bridge and canal projects more feasible and thus have more connecting links between these two oceans. Now, the real, one of the main stories is that um, we, we are living in an era which is gradually receding. That era is the era of Western dominance of the Western Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Um, Vasco da Gama took 23 days to sail from East Africa to the Indian subcontinent in 1498. That's an incredible achievement, if any of you in the audience are recreational sailors, <laughs> um, um, to cover uh, you know, two or you know, two, two, 2,500 miles or so in 23 days. He was able to do it because he had an Arab on board who knew the secrets of the monsoon winds, um, which uh, the Portuguese did not discover, but merely reacquainted Europe with, because the Romans and the Greeks knew it. Um, since 1498, you had the development of the Portuguese Empire, led by a man, Alfonso de Albuquerque, headquartered in Goa, south of Mumbai, covering ports everywhere from Yemen to Indonesia. Then you had the Dutch East India Company. You had the French in the southern third of the Indian subcontinent. You had, the Brit you had the British Royal Navy, and finally the United States Navy and Air Force after World War II. 500 years of Western domination. But that is slowly receding, as I said. At, during the era of high Reaganism in the 1980s, you had a, a Navy of 584 warships about. Um, during the Clinton era, it was in the high 330s. It's now down to 286, I believe, by by last count. Now, numbers don't tell the whole stories. Each of these ships pack a lot more equipment and firepower than those 580-odd ships of the Reagan era. Nevertheless, numbers do matter, because the fewer numbers you have, the more that your deployment decisions are fraught with risk, especially in an age of globalization, which is an era of more and more ships on the high seas. Um, um, 
that need to be protected. Um, whether the Navy will pop up over 300 warships in the next few years or gradually over the next 20 years go down to 270 or 250 depends on what expert you talk to in Washington. Uh, there is procurement problems, uh, oh, you know, great overcosting. Uh, delays and the fact that many warships commissioned in the 1970s and 80s will be decommissioned in the next decade and the decade following. So the U.S. Navy is, I would not say declining, it's plateauing out. At the same time, you have the rise of indigenous navies and air forces for really the first time since the medieval age. Um, uh, the Chinese Navy and Air Force, people know a lot about. It's been in the newspapers. Let me just tell you that the Chinese have a shop till you drop policy on submarines. Um, they've acquired or built eight times as many as the U.S. since 2005, four times as many since 2000. Um, submarines matter because naval warfare is gradually going under sea, partly because surface warships are increasingly uh, uh, vulnerable to new ballistic missile technology, to new missile technology. Um, the Chinese, you know, Chinese defense budgets go up by double digits every year for the last 30 years. Uh, China is, uh, China is, has no nefarious motives in my opinion. It's developing its military very much like the United States did. Um, after the United States started to become a great power. Remember, like China, the United States had double-digit or, si or high single-digit economic growth rates from the end of the Civil War right up to near the outbreak of World War I. And what did we do? What did Teddy Roosevelt do? He built a great navy, and he dug the Panama Canal. And why? For the same reason that Chinese are doing the same thing. Because in the process of becoming a great economic power, the United States suddenly developed trading interests all over the world, and that necessitated necessitated a military to protect those interests. So China's military growth is organic, it's natural, there's nothing illegitimate about it. It would be odd if they weren't doing it. Nevertheless, it is a fact, it is happening, and it is changing power relationships uh, in the Western Pacific and beyond. Um, India, too, is going from the fifth largest navy to perhaps the third largest navy. Uh, Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, all acquiring submarines. Um, um, South Korea, Japan, modernizing a pace very quickly. Japan has four times as many warships as the British Royal Navy and will increase um, in that amount. Um, traveling around the South China Sea, I noticed two things. Everybody's at shopping malls. Um, and the militaries are buying submarines. Submarines are like the new bling uh, uh, um, uh, um, in, in maritime Southeast Asia. Um, so indigenous countries are rising, and I can give the same numbers and stories about air forces too, because you cannot disaggregate air sea ever since the invention of the aircraft carrier, especially now, and then cyber as well. So all the so what we're seeing in, in Asia, in the Western Pacific, in what people call the Indo-Pacific, the Indian subcontinent plus the Western Pacific, is that um, we're seeing the, uh, the development not of lumbering oxen-cow land armies that are engaged in nation-building wars or, or, or guerrilla uprisings uh, like the Vietnam War, the Malaysian War in the 1960s. What you're seeing is the development of honest-to-goodness civilian military post-industrial complexes. Um, in all of these countries as the United States military plateaus out and the world, especially East, the Western Pacific, becomes less of a, of a unipolar military world and like the economic world, like the political and diplomatic world, more, more in the direction of a multipolar military world um, with, um, uh, you know, you, you know, with significant consequences for this. Now, the two most significant countries in this part of the world are China and India. Now, think of China moving vertically south towards the Indian Ocean and India moving east and west horizontally along the Indian Ocean. Um, 
China has been developing state-of-the-art port projects in Lamu and northeastern Kenya, in Gwadar and Pakistan, in Chittagong and Bangladesh, in Kayukfru and Burma, in Hambantota and Sri Lanka. Um, I've visited most of these ports, all except one, in fact. And what you see is individual Chinese companies developing ports for, for, nor, for normal, legitimate commercial reasons. Um, with no thought at the moment for to militarize them in any way. But remember, that's how the Venetian Empire began in the year 1000, you know, as, as commercial enterprises along the coast of what is today Croatia. It's how the British East India Company began, the Dutch East India Company. People don't hold a meeting around a board table and say, let's become an empire. Um, these things occur gradually over decades and centuries, beginning with pure commercial motives um, as an outgrowth of dynamic economic and political growth. Um, the Chinese are, are also running the ports now in Piraeus in Greece, in Rijeka in Croatia. Uh, so the Eastern Mediterranean is added to this as well. What I see coming is a kind of, what they're developing is commercial throughput facilities. Uh, to warehouse products, finished goods for sale in Africa, in the Middle East. Um, and um, military, using these ports as naval bases is more problematic. The one port that it really doesn't have much use now, but which is a long-range venture, is Gwadar in Pakistan. Because when you go there, there's nothing there except for Baluch rebels, um, essentially. <laughs> Um, so there's real security problems. The idea of a road and pipeline link up through Pakistan to western China is problematic, to say the least. On the other hand, the port the Chinese are building in Burma is at the opposite extreme. That's going to be very functional, or seems to be, with road and pipeline going into Yunnan province in, in southern China. And that's where we get into the whole issue. Where Burma is not just an issue of democracy, it's an issue of, of, of regionally based ethnic groups with their own militaries who need to be assuaged in a democratic process to allow some of this road and pipeline development um, um, to proceed. Uh, China has what has been called um, reportedly a Malacca dilemma. 82% of China's imported crude oil flows through the Strait of Malacca. And geography still rules. Um, Malacca is no wider now than it was in antiquity. Um, so China naturally is trying to see, look for other means to get energy, oil and natural gas, into China. So these ports work in one direction that way. Another way is, is, is a new oil and, and natural gas pipeline across Central Asia to the North Caspian and to the Turkmenistan natural gas fields to bring oil and natural gas into Western China. And then there's the oil and gas and, you know, in coal and iron ore in the Russian Far East, in Outer Mongolia and Central Asia, and, you know, and, in, and within China itself. China's trying everything. If you ask me what is China's foreign policy, I would say it's not a missionary foreign policy like that of the United States and the former Soviet Union. Uh, China is not promulgating democracy or communism around the world. It's not philosophizing. Um, it seems to be a re resource acquisition foreign policy. Uh, they will deal with any regime uh, provided they can get natural resources, which is not just oil and natural gas, it's strategic minerals and strategic metals, again, to a totally legitimate purpose, uh, to raise the standard of living of hundreds of millions of people into the global middle class. Um, and in the process, they, you know, they become a great power. Um, so um, India, you know, it's interesting in India. One of the most talked about people in India is, um, among the elites that is, is, George, is Lord George Nathaniel Curzon. Now Curzon was the Viceroy of India from 1899 to 1905. And the reason Indian elites are intrigued with Curzon was not only, uh, you know, what, was he one of the, the best Viceroys, but he had a strategic vision where Delhi, where not Delhi, because at the time the 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 the, the, um, 
the, uh, India was run from what is today Calcutta, from Kolkata. But, it, but Curzon saw the world from Kolkata, not from London. And he saw a greater India, including Pakistan, Myanmar, Bangladesh, southern Nepal, with shadow zones of influence in Iran, Central Asia, and Southeast Asia as well. And what, what that vision does, coupled with Chinese virtual expansion, is it makes China and India rivals for the first time in their collective histories. Because remember, except for the spread of Buddhism in the third century BC, China and India really had relatively little to do with each other. Uh, separated by the high walls of the Himalayas, two rich civilizations developing separately. But because of the, uh, the collapse of distance due to the advance of military technology, with Chinese fighter jets operating out of Tibetan airfields with their arc of operations, including the Indian subcontinent, um, and Indian warships in the South China Sea and Chinese warships in the Indian Ocean. Uh, you have overlapping spheres of interest for the first time. And, and when you can also factor in their economic heft, their demographic heft, they're becoming rivals. Though it's not a hot-blooded rivalry, it has no ethnic or sectarian basis behind it. So it's not like India or Pakistan. It's more of a cool rivalry. Indians like it when you t ask them questions about it. They want to be hyphenated with China. They don't want to be hyphenated with Pakistan. Um, you know, being hyphenated with China raises their stature um, um, in a way. So this is the world we're inheriting. As American power, I don't, you, I, I don't say the word decline merely normalizes as other countries, in relative terms, indigenous countries rise up. Let me just end with a few words about the South China Sea. Um, the South China Sea, um, think of the South China Sea the way Americans thought of the Caribbean in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, when you say you're a specialist in the Caribbean, you're not going to be invited to join a think tank or anything. <laughs> um, uh, but there was a time in American history during quite a few administrations was the Caribbean was the center of American foreign policy. Uh, you know, the, mainly much of the second half of the 19th century and early 20th. Why? There was a Dutch-American uh, a geopolitician, Nicholas Spikeman at Yale in the early 1940s, who divided the Western Hemisphere not between North and South America, but between North of the Amazon and South of the Amazon. Because he said the Amazon is the real dividing point. Places like Venezuela and Colombia may technically be part of the South America, but they're Caribbean countries. Um, so it was America's gradual naval dominance of the Caribbean in the late 19th century that allowed it to dominate the hemisphere. And once it could dominate the hemisphere, it had power to spare to effect, help affect the balance of power in the other hemisphere, the eastern hemisphere. China thinks of the South China Sea in similar terms. Um, China sees the South China Sea as a place rich, perhaps, in oil and natural gas. Uh, it's 80% of its crude oil imports come through there. Uh, the South China Sea is where, uh, you know, gets uh, three times as much traffic for energy than, than the Suez Canal and about 15 times as much as the, as the Panama Canal. Uh, China bristles at the fact that the United States Navy and Air Force are the dominant powers there. China has uh, claims, uh, conflicting claims with all of the littoral states like Vietnam, the Philippines, um, uh, Malaysia, and others. And were China to be able to, to dominate the South China Sea, which I don't think is likely at all in the near future, but were it able to, it would then have power to spare to expand into the Indian Ocean and to, uh, you know, and, and, and to become a great power in the sense that the U.S. became a great power um, after, uh, you know, after it dominated the Caribbean. And the, and the way I, this analogy of the Caribbean, I didn't invent. It was told to me by Chinese colonels uh, because they said, how can you lecture us when you did this and that to the Caribbean? Uh, you know, when I, when I would ask them about the South China Sea. 
So uh, we're, entering, um, we're entering a new world where American power is not in decline in absolute terms, but in relative terms, we're seeing the rises the, of indigenous powers, not just India and China, but Vietnam, uh, uh, um, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, other places. We're going to we're going to have more of a complex India, more of a complex power arrangement. In, in a maritime environment. And the United States, and I'll close with this, has basically experienced, with some great exceptions, uh, an air-land continental environment through much of the 20th century because the center of the action was Europe. Um, and then the center of the action was ground wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. But in focusing on Asia, we're entering more of a maritime air-sea environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Yes. Thank you. A, lot, a lot to marinate on that. Uh, we're going to sort of have a discussion with the panelists and, and you know, uh, pose questions to Bob as well. But I wanted to start with Tom Donnelly because I think so, so the burden of um, some of what Bob just said was the idea, of, uh, as I understand it, Tom, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was a debate inside the Pentagon um, sort of in the years after 9-11, fairly carefully disguised between people some people saying that China was a benign force, and so apparently Colonel uh, Carl Eikenbury, a Mandarin speaker, who went on to become the commanding general in Afghanistan, taking that approach, and Andy Marshall, the famous uh, head of, of the Office of Net Assessment, uh, now 90, uh, taking the opposite approach, and apparently Marshall won that uh, debate. So what's your personal opinion about, the, about this? <laughs> Marshall is 90 now. Well, Andy had an ally in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, now that... Um, First of all, I would say I just love Bob's presentation because I just the he correctly frames the issues, I would say. And he talks about the things that are critically important, like geography, military power, and the things that have always been the dispositive factors of international politics as long as we've recorded human history. Uh, so that uh, is clarifying to begin with, and I'm perfectly happy to have those conversations on that on that ground uh, just because it's the right conversation to have. Uh, and I have some differences which will no doubt surface over the course of the evening. But to uh, take your question, Peter, there's still, you know, that debate still goes on. It's very difficult to reduce uh, thinking about China to, you know, to the, you know, sort of blue or red friend or enemies uh, uh, on or off dichotomy. Uh, however, the pattern of events has tended to tilt the, you know, it's Chinese behavior uh, that sort of made the Andy Marshall crowd, if you will, the sort of de facto uh, winner in that because, as Bob said, uh, they're acting like a traditional rising great power. The, the military that China is acquiring uh, it is not a military that's going to secure its trade uh, or reinforce the security architecture that currently exists, things like submarines and highly accurate ballistic missiles that hold particularly American surface combatants and aircraft carriers at, at risk, can only be described whether by, without ascribing any intent to China, as systems that are threatening to the current, to the U.S. military, the militaries of our allies and the security architecture as it exists. So whatever Beijing's intent may be, and I, I think it's a debate. I'm not sure that uh, the Chinese even really sort of have figured out what kind of world they want to live in. And God knows uh, we made huge mistakes and other great powers have made huge mistakes as we've kind of blundered our way uh, around the planet. Why should we expect, expect the Chinese to be really any better than anyone else. But the facts of the case are that China's military power is a serious threat to the continued um, preeminence of American military forces to those of our close allies and treaty allies and is inherently destabilizing. So it's not just that we feel this way, but it's gotten the attention of a whole host of uh, other countries in the regions ranging from the Vietnamese to, you know, at one end of the spectrum apropos of us to the Japanese and the 
Koreans, and, and certainly it's gotten the Indian uh, attention as well. So that is a military strategic fact of life in the Indo-Pacific these days, and probably the central fact. Patrick Cronin, uh, you wrote a piece for CNN, uh, which I think came out today. With uh, this is part of a series. Uh, the series is really about the election, and you posed <laughs> ten questions for uh, either uh, Romney or Obama about China specifically. What, what are the what are the most pressing and most nettlesome questions if uh, when they come to a debate uh, on the matter of China that you would pose as a sort of um, notional debate moderator? Well, on Friday, I'll see an old friend, Professor Wong Jiu who recently received a lot of press attention because he says many Chinese officials and friends of his um, are increasingly believing that the China-U.S. relationship is becoming a zero-sum game. It's, it's really a strategic rivalry is dominating over cooperation. And I've long believed that, uh, for the reasons Tom stated, that uh, China's breakneck gains in the last several decades means that we can't ignore China. We have to consider relationship building, infrastructure, complex weapon systems that take decades to nurture and bring about in case Chinese intentions change along with their growing capacity. Um, so asking the presidential candidates about how the United States sees China in the round, how do we get this balance right? Because that is the tricky question for America's future. The world is changing, as, as Bob Kaplan stated. It's very complex. It's not just decline, it's, but it is relative decline. And um, China ascent, China's ascent may plateau itself. It may even start to decline. There are questions about the pace of Chinese change, and certainly the internal domestic politics of China. We certainly see signals right now that there are some very interesting trends that we're not sure what this portends. But change happens, and it's more complex. So trying to understand how the next president of the United States will uh, establish a relationship with China that builds cooperation but doesn't sacrifice strength at the same time, doesn't sacrifice U.S. influence, which every country in the region wants two things. They want more trade and economic uh, interaction with China, and they want a strong America present but not destabilizing the region. Steve, you've had some discussions with uh, senior officers in the People's Liberation Army about a year ago. Uh, yeah, so the, last summer. Last yeah. summer. What, were the, what were the sort of, what were the substance of those conversations to the extent that you can... Get the hell out of the South China Sea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, mostly that. Uh, I, I was struck, first of all, I loved listening to Bob. It was a great presentation and uh, delightful. And uh, one of its themes, though, that I wanted to introduce, which was a theme of my uh, visit in, in China, is what is actually the relationship between military power and trading interests? If, if this is the world, if, if China's foreign policy is not missionary, but it's about resource acquisition, um, and they're building a military to defend that policy or to promote it, is that mercantilist attitude inherited from colonial and imperial experiences of the West in the 19th century is it really responsive to the actual world that Bob described of growing economic integration, growing liquidity, growing globalization? I think this is an argument that the Chinese hear sometimes and haven't quite taken on board yet. But, but here's what I mean. All of the commodities and resources that China requires to industrialize and modernize, except maybe arguably, arguably natural gas and perhaps some special metals, but certainly oil, and, and virtually all of the other major industrial resources that they, they require. These are global commodities that are traded on a global basis, priced on a global basis, are totally interchangeable, and owning them may be an interesting speculative investment if you have too many dollars, which is the Chinese position, but it doesn't actually involve security uh, unless you're in a complete global conflagration in which everyone is fighting to block the other's access to, to global resources. So this idea that, the, that resource acquisition inevitably involves the projection of territorial power and control in a world of greater and greater interconnectedness, I'm not sure is, is correct. Um, it depends, at a minimum. And then there's one other implication of that, which is 
if you're trying, if you're trying and you look out at that world and you still have this mercantilist attitude and you think, well, I actually do want to own them all. I don't care where they are. I want to own them and then I want to build my own militarized supply lines to control them under any circumstances. What's your problem? The problem is that the United States Navy and Air Force is the guarantor of free commerce on the seas. So you're not in a position to control your own supply lines. Well, one alternative, as Bob alluded to, would be land corridors in Central Asia, that great movie, you know, There Will Be Blood, about the oil industry where one uh, person eventually says to the other, coveting his oil field and using horizontal drilling to access it improperly, <laughs> says, you know, I, I stick my straw in your milkshake <laughs> and I drink it. Well, you know, a, a more stable strategy for China's resource inputs would be to stick a straw under Russia, depopulating mm -hmm. Russia, and drink it, and under Central Asia as well. That way you stay off the seas uh, to the greatest degree possible. But as Bob says, they're doing everything. Yeah. But, but fundamentally their orientation remains this kind of mercantilist one, and it could involve actually investing in the wrong strategy from their perspective. It may be that cyber and the rest of the investment, space investments, would be a much wiser way for them to think about their own position. Uh, yeah, um, let, let me pick up particularly on, on what Steve said. First of all, three things. The first is that um, you, n who knows what China's motives are, and nobody knows what they'll be in 20 or 30 years. But you don't track motives because they can change and you could get motives, the other guy's motives wrong. So you, tr you track capabilities. And so as they develop capabilities, we have to respond. Um, the second thing that I neglected to mention is the biggest question in international affairs, in my opinion, is um, the direction of China's domestic society. Because were China to have a, a fundamental socio-economic political crisis at home that could change the trajectory of their defense budgets, uh, we could be looking at a different world in 20 years. Uh, a world where Chinese defense budgets don't go up by 10% a year, but only by 4 or 5% a year, could be a different East Asia um, in 20 years. Um, back to Steve's specific um, question. Um, actually, the Chinese do have an historical model on this. It's, uh, you know, he's been popularized already, uh, already. I'm not saying anything new. It's Admiral Tsung Hee from the early Ming Dynasty. Um, who traveled with his treasure ships, as they, his treasure fleet, as he called them, all the way to Somalia and Yemen. Um, uh, and some of his, uh, so he was a Muslim of Mongolian descent who sailed for China in the early Ming Dynasty. And some of his comrades on board actually made the pilgrimage to Mecca. All right, why am I bringing him up? Because the treasure fleet, which went all over the South China Sea and the greater Indian Ocean, combined military might with trade. It was, we're here to trade, but we're the biggest guy on the block, so watch out for us. So it's, you know, it's a loving hand that wants international trade, but it's a strong hand as well. And China can, uh, you know, China can project power. Now, what brought an end to all this was an ill-thought-out war against the Mongols. Um, so that China was, de the Mings were devastated and they pulled back on their seafaring expeditions. Um, and the very fact that China is building a great navy is sort of a luxury. Uh, because uh, island nations build navies anyway, because they're island nations. But a great continental power like China only goes to sea if it has the luxury of safe and secure land borders. Now, a lot, now, China's borders are not all safe and secure, but they're more safe and secure than they've been in decades or maybe centuries. Um, so that China is going to see because it has the luxury of doing so. It's doing so because it's basically telling the world we're secure at home. We don't have problems with the Kazakhs or the five million Russians in the Russian Far East because we've got 100 million Manchurians on the other side of the border. Uh, yes, we fought a war with India. It was a low-level war, war in, the, in, in, in the Himalayan foothills, but it's not coming back anytime soon, probably. So that, the, is China pursuing a mercantilist policy? At the moment, I think it is. I think at the moment, it 
it, it, it feels umbrage at the fact that it can't really challenge the U.S. with anti-access in the South China Sea or elsewhere in the Western Pacific if, they, if it depends implicitly on the U.S. Navy to protect the sea, China's own sea lines of communication because the Indian Ocean is the world's global energy interstate but to a large extent because of China. Because China imports all this oil and natural gas from the greater Middle East across the Indian Ocean, thanks to the U.S. Navy and Air Force, into China. And China doesn't want to live with that situation Even though they forever. can free ride on it. Though. Yeah, yeah. Because we're not, we're not charging them for that. And, and because they're free riding, their power is rising in the world, where we're spending ourselves all over, uh, some would say, to oblivion. You know, uh, uh, you know, in, in many operations around the world. But nevertheless, I, you know, I detect that they, are, they don't like this situation. If I could chime in. I mean, the striking thing to me is, is that we look at the facts and think that the, this is the marketplace in action. The Chinese look at it and see the marketplace as a giant American conspiracy that constrains <laughs> and contains them. <laughs> well, they, you know, we are wrong to abstract out the exercise of American geopolitical power in all its forms from the operation of the marketplace. The marketplace doesn't operate if there are troubling things like wars that sort of disrupt the free flow of capital and goods and people and stuff like that. So uh, it, we at least need to acknowledge that the, the international system, to use the broadest possible term, that exists is, is a creation in time and space essentially of uh, American power in the 20th century, and particularly after World War II. It's been a huge, you know, that's, that's what was the argument made by the Carl Eikenberry cabal, if you will. Ch we actually see China's national interests as well as Beijing does, or as, better, as well as the Chinese do, and they will naturally come around once they recognize the logic of all this. Well, they haven't, and maybe their appreciation of the logic uh, is is pretty compelling, at least to them. Isn't it kind of the main counter-argument to some of this to say, you know, we have 11, we, the United States, have 11 aircraft carriers and they have zero? Well, we have 11 at the moment. It may be 10 uh, soon. They're, they have one and they're trying to acquire three, but they don't need to project power globally if they're really trying to evict us, essentially, out of the littoral seas in the East and South China Sea. This incident this past month in Scarborough Shoal, in the Spratly Islands between the Philippines and China is emblematic of what we're going to see in the future, which is more strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China through proxies, in a sense, because what's happening, the Philippines deployed as their flagship naval ship the Coast Guard cutter we just sent them, and China stopped it using civilian surveillance ships, but they still managed to stop that ship from arresting the illegal fishermen, at least from the Philippine point of view, the Chinese fishermen, um, the Chinese may have been sending a bigger signal than just saying we're going to do things when the Chinese say it's okay to do it here, it's disputed waters and territories. They were trying to send a signal, I believe, back to the United States. If you want to increase your influence in this region, even indirectly by helping the Philippines, we will deny that because we want it actually moving in the other direction. And it may not be a malicious view. But that is the overall weight of their policy, of their anti-access strategies, and of their diplomacy. Let's throw it open to questions. If you have a question, can you raise your hand and identify yourself? And Fred Kaplan. Uh, uh, Fred Kaplan. So, Bob, I'm, I'm a little unclear on your bottom line. What, what do you think the U.S. ought to do about this? Uh, I mean, on the one hand, you say their motives, Chinese motives, are perfectly logical, etc. On the other hand, well, their capabilities have been ominous. But what do we do about it? Do we double, do we move toward doubling the Navy? Do we go three more aircraft carriers? Do we, you know, go 10 submarines in the next 10 years? Um, I, I think what we do about it is what we have been doing about it. Um, the Navy is more or less plateauing out. I believe that we can fulfill our defense capabilities well with the present size of the Navy, provided it doesn't get smaller or much smaller. Um, you, you know, the, again, the numbers game is so one-dimensional, um, you know, because there are so many other factors. You can count missile launchers on ships and this and that. 
Um, but provided we don't go down to a 250 ship Navy, you know, or something like that, we can acquit our responsibilities well. Provided that we don't have another land war in the in the Middle East, uh, we can we can um, we can acquit our responsibilities well. I think the pivot to the Pacific announced by Secretary Clinton. Uh, though it's been criticized a lot, basically it makes undeniable sense um, in this respect. Um, the pivot is 20 years late in a way. Uh, uh, you know, we should have pivoted to the Pacific after the Berlin Wall fell, but what happens? Uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait. That tied down not just the U.S. Army, but the Air Force and Navy in no-fly zones uh, for a decade afterwards. Then there was 9-11, the two Gulf Wars. So the pivot is very natural. There's nothing very ominous or even creative about it. Um, it's natural because to the degree that the world economy has a geographic heart, it's the Western Pacific, it's East Asia. Um, and to the degree, you know, where it's, merchant sea lines tend to converge more than in any other part of the world, it's East Asia. So this is the economic heart of the world. This is where our military should be focused to protect the balance of power and to allow the free trading system to, um, uh, you, you know, to, to go on as it has. Um, um, so I don't think that, we, that there's anything um, fundamentally wrong with our policy on this. You can criticize, you know, the fact that it, it shouldn't cost four billion dollars to produce a new destroyer or 18 billion for a new carrier with all the planes on it. You can write endless pieces on that, how ridiculous that has gotten. But in terms of having a, you know, a robust Navy oriented with the, with the West, with the Indo-Pacific as the first among equals as opposed to the Atlantic and the Pacific, in, you know, in, in earlier, you know, in the late 20th century, I think is fine. And I think that we will have to accommodate ourselves somewhat to the rise of Chinese naval and air power uh, um, it, um, in the region. I think that's inevitable because uh, the, the post-World War II situation where China was, had its infrastructure devastated, Japan did as well, and we were the only person on the block, so to speak, simply cannot continue into the future. So we will have a more multipolar Pacific. The idea is that we will remain robust enough um, so that China eventually is unable to Finlandize places like Vietnam and Malaysia and the Philippines. Right, and, and just to add quickly <clears throat> the end of that thought, the, at issue is not a fiscally strained United States stretching over the Pacific horizon to contest China's rise alone. It is the totality of countries on China's perimeter who added all together, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, South Korea, Japan, Australia, not to mention you know, Burma and India, that constitutes a pretty substantial part of yeah. the region's future and capability. And I was just in Vietnam uh, last week, we were talking about it, and I, I'm not a deep expert on Vietnam, but I went to the, uh, all of the sort of national narrative museums constructed by the party to tell the story of Vietnam. And in one stage, I actually took notes about the, the totality of the displays. How does Vietnam see its own position against a rising China? Well. 80% of the narrative is about Vietnam and China. 10% is about the American war, and the rest is about France. And so, you know, we're not, we're not, it's not us uh, who yeah. constitute the, this, yeah. the t entirety of this narrative. If, if I could, sorry, if I could further sort of confound the, uh, uh, this is, a, I think, an important one. I would characterize Bob's view as an excessively Tory blue water strategy uh, approach to uh, the Pacific to, to uh, do violence to history. And, and Steve suggests a more Whiggish uh, traditional approach that, that combines uh, alliances. Uh, you know, again, this is, you know, we're kind of imitating uh, British imperial policy, if you will. So in addition to, you know, continuing to rule the waves and never being slaves, uh, uh, combining uh, uh, in coalitions that can change and evolve with other regional powers, particularly continental powers. Uh, as Bob rightly says, uh, China's maritime power projection is a bit of a luxury uh, of historical circumstance. Uh, 
And if you sort of ask yourself, what is what do the Chinese fear deep in their collective unconscious the most? It's a land invasion or problems on the continent. Again, maybe there's a message for us that we could, uh, you know. Uh, remember, if you're a country like from. Vietnam, which I think has about 83 million people, it's like an evolving maritime Turkey, as I, you know, as I, as I write it. Like it could be a real robust middle-level power. Um, if you're a Vietnam, or if you're a Malaysia, it's n China's power is not just the fact that it's building submarines. It's China's demographic power, it's its economic power, it's its geographical centrality to your region, plus it's its evolving military power. It's all of those things put together uh, so that you can rightly fear that were America, you know, the American air-sea presence to measurably decline, you could rightly fear a kind of Finlandization by China. Patrick, what, were you, what did you say uh, when you testified uh, on North Korea today? That we need a long-term strategy. Really, it's a Washington failure on both parties to force the community to come together on a committed long-term strategy for actually changing North Korea's cycle of prevarication, provocation, um, not to mention human rights abuses. And that's not easy to bring about. And frankly, there wasn't a lot of tolerance to listen to what a variegated strategy would look like, because it's not a simple strategy, um, but it's a very important one. We talked obviously a lot about the tactical failures that led to the leap day agreement of the administration with the Kim Jong-un uh, transitional government in uh, North Korea. Um, but those are tactics as opposed to the real strategy. And so the real strategy issue is how do we break this cycle of how North Korea keeps... Uh, imagine this, the United States, the great power, goes to Korea and has a nuclear summit, brings all the leaders of the world together. And North Korea is off preparing its missile test, even though they just promised not to test one. And the next week, they force the U.S. Navy, the Japanese Navy, Maritime Self-Defense Forces, the South Korean Navy, um, China, Russia, all to congregate in the East and South China Seas with their military forces on hair trigger alert. I mean, how does a 29-year-old uh, leader who, uh, you know, had two bad years of boarding school in Switzerland um, bring this about when we can't seem to orchestrate a more effective international pressure uh, to change this pattern of behavior? And it just reminds us of how limited we are in our ability to execute an idea and see it through to success. It's, and I can, I can, I, you can read my testimony, it's on the web of the Center for New American Security about how I think this strategy could go about, but it's, it's not all laid out there for, for some reasons, but at least the building blocks of it are there. What's the headline? Well, we need three basic things. We need new instruments of pressure. Some of those are the, the precision-guided financial measures that we, we know about that we haven't really followed through on. Um, we, we need a, a much more rigorous information strategy, radio, other means. You can't keep – China and South Korea are so wealthy now compared to North Korea that you cannot keep the information out in the 21st century the way you could before. It's seeping in. It seeped in in a big way to the 50,000 North Korean workers who are working at the South Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex that I've written about. Um, it's seeping across the Chinese border. They can't keep this out. Even Kim Jong-un seems to understand that information – is going to have to be dealt with differently from his father and grandfather. And the third leg, uh, besides an information strategy and a pressure strategy, is there's going to have to be an engagement strategy, a bad word, in Washington right now, because it, you can't trust the North. But if you're going, uh, one of the things that's unacceptable for, I think should be for Americans and American decision makers, is that we do not have any direct access to Kim Jong-un, his key regent, Jong Sung Tech, the two generals who surround him and advise him on everything. Zero contact with the top leadership is unacceptable for American taxpayers. And I'd love to hear, you know, Governor Romney and President Obama talk about, in an election year, how are we going to break that and start to maybe find out if we can change this top-down leadership. I think you need the engagement partly to get the information in. Questions uh, in the back? Questions are better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
Well, um, thank you. The, um, the question about whether regional architecture in Northeast Asia could bring about a successful soft landing in North Korea, um, obviously the six-party talks of China, Russia, South Korea, Japan, the United States, and North Korea has been the multilateral effort of the last several years. It's been largely focused on the nuclear issue. The problem with focusing exclusively, though, on the nuclear issue is that if North Korea really only has six to ten plutonium bombs or enough fissile material for six to ten, and that's a supposition, we don't know for sure, but that's one of the best guesses that's out in the public, they're hardly going to negotiate that away or trade it away and proliferate it away. The good news is they're not going to sell that to the Middle East, perhaps, because it's limited. They really need that for their insurance policy. We need to figure out how to deal with some other issues, though, about North Korea. But how do we do that when the regime is so oppressive? It takes all the money that comes in. It steals food aid. So this is, this is the trick. We've been trying in Washington simply to coordinate with our chief ally in Seoul. And over the years, that's been either difficult or recently it's been very easy. But just because it's easy doesn't make it successful. As we see, the, the, the cooperation between U.S. and South Korea has reached an all-time high, but we are no more effective in bringing North Korea down to some kind of an agreement. But the general position that we need a multilateral framework for helping to deal with this is going to be very important if we can overcome uh, North Korea's cycle. Eventually, I look at Burma, I look at Myanmar, and I'll be going there next month, and how they have shifted. Now, they have Aung San Suu Kyi, and North Korea has no, you know, not even the beginning of a reform movement. Forget about an Aung San Suu Kyi, an iconic figure of, of good governance or democracy. But nonetheless, we need to start breaking up and in, in getting information in and seeing maybe it is Chang Sung Tech who uh, thinks that he wants to be a Gorbachev and reform the system. He thinks he can save it. But in the process of thinking he can save it, maybe things change in a way that open this up. We'll need the region together on this. Um, the other comment you made about whether China looks at Japan's history is important because we're just about to release a brand new report on the U.S.-Japan alliance called the China Challenge. And we call explicitly for a China-Japan-U.S. energy security dialogue so that we can deal with that issue. Gentleman in front. Yes, uh, Jay Pulaski. I have a question for the, for the panel, and it may be uh, somewhat of a bit of heresy. But if uh, China wants to evict us uh, from the South China Sea, uh, and why don't we just leave? Let them have it. They need it so much more than we do, and they're going to need it more as they develop. Well, 1992, we did leave Subic and Clark. We left, we left the naval and air base in 1992, and that's when Mr. Reef then happened, a militarized incident in the region where the Chinese occupied uh, a disputed uh, territory. So there are downsides to just leaving the region. The, the key reason not to leave the South China Sea, and we're not there in a big way other than our potential over-the-horizon presence or passage through, innocent passage, but the, the key reason is because of the reassurance that almost all the other countries surrounding China are seeking from the United States. If we don't reassure them, their policies end up being fairly negative, including runaway nationalism, including security arrangements that may not be uh, favorable to the United States, um, including the fact that we may just be downgraded much, much further in Asia's mind about whether the United States matters should be listened to on anything. But anyway, Tom. Yeah, yeah look, I, look, I mean, uh, as Bob rightly said, this is going to be the, uh, you know, uh, hothouse of global human development for the foreseeable future for decades to come. The arrangements that now exist are a creation of American effort with allies and with others, not solely an American effort, but the, the development of, of China, of Japan, of South Korea, of all the, which is not just economic development, but then political development as well. If there's any, you know, trend in the region that gets, you know, it becomes so commonplace that nobody observes it anymore, it's the democratization of a culture, a political culture that didn't have much uh, history of that uh, previously. So there's a lot to play for. America has always been a Pacific power, and the world will look very different if the outcome well, the is, 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 is negative. I mean, uh, it won't be just confined to the region. 
Globalization means globalization. There's been Americanized globalization, but if there's some other form of globalization that includes accommodation, I mean, China's not an ideological communist power, but it is a nationalist, uh, you know, more, it's like a post-Westphalian state, and we're a post-post, you know, there's fundamentally common regimes of governance where, uh, where we're talking about here. And so the world will be quite different and I think uh, more, more dangerous as well as less uh, you know, hospitable to American ideals, American people, and American interests. Um, you raise a very fundamental question. And what, if I could rephrase your question is what exactly <laughs> Is the you know what exactly does America do? Uh, now, what is its purpose with all these warships that cost billions and and planes? That, I mean, I mean, one F twenty two could fund relief missions throughout sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, I've actually done the numbers on this. Um, uh, so, what are we there for? And if we left, what would the world look like afterwards? And by the world, you might as well take East Asia, Southeast Asia, because as I said previously, that's the heart to the degree that the global economy has a demographic and economic heart, that's it. It's that if you extract the American presence, you know, in, in this theoretical way you framed it, just leave completely, suddenly in the Indian-China rivalry would not be so benign. The Indian-Russian uh, rivalry would not be so benign. Uh, the Indian, uh, the Chinese-Vietnamese, I mean, the Chinese-Russian rivalry would not be so benign. The Chinese-Vietnamese relationship would not be that benign. These are countries that could easily go to war. Um, the fact that most of their rivalries are benign, the fact that if China and India and China and Vietnam have not fought a war since 1979, China and India since 1962, despite the fact that what we see is really jockeying for position on the high seas, more than real strong outbreaks of hostilities, is because of the pacifying effect of an American military hegemon. Um, um, in, the, in the area. And, so, and that pacifying effect allows world trade to happen. Well, wouldn't it be great if we had a war where we were not part of it? Uh, no, I don't uh, think that would be like great. Like an India-Pakistan uh, 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 exchange, uh, that would be... Uh, <laughs> oh, a, a war where we weren't yeah, part yeah, of it. We Excuse me, I, 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 yeah, I, I didn't hear your, uh, I didn't hear your question well. Remember, it's not just democracy that America offers the world. It's the protection of trade and commerce. And look, the, again, the great surprise, historical surprise of recent decades has been the absence of great power war. I mean, Europe has passed into, a, you know, it's almost unimaginable that there would be a war among European great powers who are no longer great powers. You know, that after 400 years of Europe exporting its wars to the rest of the world, that's something that we should let go of, you know, very reluctantly and not spin into a new set of, you know, just because it's traditional and historical, you know, there are historical precedents, precedents for competing powers struggling. Again, that's what's produced wars. It's the absence of competition that's been remarkable about the recent decades. And that's, you know, that's, I think, something very valuable. Let's gather up uh, two or three questions. This gentleman here. Are we so sure that China would not simply replace the United States as the guarantor of the commons, that it would not, like the United States, buy into the liberal international order? Why are we so sure that it's fundamentally different in the incentives that it would face as a regional power? Um, I'm not so sure. Uh, uh, you know, it may, it may buy in, though it would be different. You know, Chinese hegemony would be different because China is different from the United States. Whether it would be uh, whether it would be detrimental to the world system, I I don't know. Um, I don't know. I know that as China rises, uh, it's it, it, you know it, it's rising is very aggressive um, in the way that it's uh, in the way that it stopped American ships and others. Um, though, if you look at 19th century American Navy in the early 20th century, uh, America was quite an aggressive. 
uh, power in its own right, especially in conquering the western half of the continent. Um, so that, um, so that you know, this may be just you know the tendency of rising powers, and once they have risen, they become more, uh, uh, um, um, more, um, more amenable, more confident, and with that confidence comes you know a, a, a more of a diplomatic attitude. But I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm Peter. I'm, I should shut up. So. Okay. <laughs> I certainly couldn't agree more with the idea that our economy is the foundation of our strength and our position. America has to get its own economic house in order, and there are a lot of problems that we have to grapple with. We certainly need, when we talk about on a policy level, things like a regional trading agreement, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is going to take years to try to negotiate, what's missing behind that is the real business and investment in our own manufacturing base. Those are the things that are unfortunately lagging way behind even policymakers who want to project an economic footprint because ultimately we should be leading with economics and diplomacy in the region just backed up by a strong military to help guarantee rules of the road and an open inclusive system based on rules. That's really our aim. It's a favorable balance of power. It's not conflict. But we need that strong economy. China's not necessarily stolen all of the high value complex systems integration that we are better at. Our innovation is also another glaring problem right now. China may be a generation behind. But if the trend is any future projection, they're catching up. Um, I would just add that actually, over the next few years, I think the real, um, one of the, what could be a big news story is uh, the, you know, the economic social tensions within China itself. Um, uh, our problems are out in the open. Um, there's a lot wrong with the American system, but it is fundamentally legitimate. Um, it's unclear how fundamentally legitimate the Chinese system is. Uh, Chinese autocrats are certainly not like Middle East autocrats. Um, you know, they're not decayed reptilian people in their <laughs> 80s who have not developed the economy, who have giant posters on the board about how great they are. Um, you know, this is a collegial leadership. They retire at 65. They've, you know, they've given their people decades of economic growth that's lifted them out not just economically, but provided personal freedoms, if not political freedoms. So I'm not making that comparison, but nevertheless, China could could face a real strong internal crisis built on the you know the revolution of rising expectations or something like that. Take one final question here. I need to let others speak. I do think they are aiming to build a long-range nuclear weapon that can hit American soil. I think there's no doubt, and I think they'd like to test even in the next year possibly a uranium-based uh, weapon, which would change the game fundamentally because it's harder to detect, easier to proliferate, and would give them a much more potent capability. So it really puts us in a very difficult situation, but I'll let Tom answer how we get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the one thing I would add to Patrick's earlier uh, exposition is we really need to figure out what we're trying to achieve. I mean, there, there are many paths uh, that will take us there, but the problem is we don't really know, and, and neither do the Chinese or the Japanese or the other members of the six-party consortium. Or Nobody knows what they want. You know, do we want regime, the regime to survive but not be quite so crazy and troublesome? 
Well, that's not likely. But do we really want to face uh, what the collapse of the regime uh, would mean? And that's that's a pretty complicated question when you start thinking about it, particularly if you start thinking about how the Chinese would look at look at that. I mean, the balance of power on the Korean Peninsula will matter regardless of uh, whether there's still, you know, Neanderthals ruling in Pyongyang, I think. Any final thoughts, Steve, or Bob? Thank you. Um, it, just a final thought on North Korea. Right. Um, we've seen in the 20th century the collapse of divided countries, the reunification in Germany, Yemen, uh, Vietnam. All of these cases happened without any prior uh, uh, warning. Uh, uh, it happened tumultuously, relatively fast. All the experts seemed wrong. Um, uh, we should not rule out um, uh, some sort of regime unraveling in our lifetimes in the northern half of the Korean Peninsula that would uh, create the mother of all humanitarian emergencies and uh, would really, uh, you know, shuffle the cards in Northeast Asia. Well, thank you for that. Optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. That's all we got. Thank you to our panel. <laughs>